Uh, Y'all read that email about finals? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any questions about that? About the lack of finals? Yeah, we got an email. So how's our how's the rest of the year gonna look for us then? It's gonna go the same, just no final. So uh, for this class specifically. Yeah, yeah, actually I had already I'd known for a while that there would be no finals and I had planned accordingly. That's why there was no review built in to the end of the year. Um, we're just gonna have a quiz for this chapter, a test for this chapter, and then that'll be it in terms of like major grades. So make sure that everything that you can turn in is turned in. And then uh, pass that. The last thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna start doing limits. Um, and there will be homework associated with that stuff, the introduction to calculus work that we'll be doing. Um, but homework only, there will be no quizzes or tests on limits. I just wanna make sure that you guys see those ideas and vocab before you're hit with them hard for the first time at the top of next school year. Uh, but yeah, I, um, I don't know, I, you know, finals, it doesn't even really matter to me because finals never surprise me. They just tell me what I already know and they very rarely change anybody's grades. Usually people score on the final, whatever their grade average was anyway, which will just like solidify that grade. It's pretty rare that, um, I've had a case where somebody's grade is drastically swung by a final. And usually when somebody's grade is drastically swung by a final, it's because they had a bad day the day of the final. And then it suddenly like sucker punched their grade. Uh, it's not that big of a deal to me. Uh, anyway, let's go ahead and get started with what we're doing today. And just so you know, um, I'm gonna, I'll be moving stuff around today. We're actually gonna move forward through lecture. So I know that I said today was going to be the 11.3 workshop since we didn't have class yesterday. I think 11.3 is pretty easy, uh, while 11.4 is not. So I'm gonna go ahead and move the 11.3 homework. Uh, it's due Monday night, um, because today we're gonna do lecture, so that next week there is no lecture. It'll just be um, next week on Monday and Tuesday, we'll have days to work on 11.3 or 11.4, or the mid-chapter review that I'm gonna post. And then y'all have a quiz on Wednesday, so that we can uh, wrap this stuff up in a bow and uh, not think about any pre-cal anything until after AP tests are all done. Um, <clears throat> yeah, are there any questions on that stuff? So all I'm actually doing today, the only change is that I'm swapping what we were gonna do today and what we were gonna do Monday. I just want you guys to see this lecture so that it can marinate over the weekend. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. And uh, if you have any questions about this stuff at the top, I can also deal with questions from the homework. Also, does the video feed look weird? Does it look blurry or something? Or is that just me? No, it looks good. Uh, give me one second, I'm gonna let this thing autofocus. Yeah, it was off by one. Focus should be 16, exposure should be negative five. Apply, okay. Um, stupid camera. Okay, anyway. Mr. Robinson? Yeah? Do you mind if I join with my computer too? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, usually um, in AP Physics, there's a senior, Michael, he always joins with two devices because he usually watches the lecture on his laptop, uh, but he has his headphones plugged into his tablet because he does his notes on his like tablet on um, Microsoft OneNote. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started just because we've been chilling here for a while. Uh, so item number one here, uh, what is my explicit sequence? So our explicit sequence, B sub N, is going to be equal to what? 13 times negative two, two over three, so negative two thirds to the power of N, uh, B minus. 
Uh, very good. So our explicit sequence oh, yeah. here is that it's equal to our first term multiplied by our common ratio raised to the power of n minus one. Uh, our common ratio is pretty easy to figure out. You can see it right here. The top is getting multiplied by two and then we're getting a three in the denominator. Also, if this second term is negative, your common ratio has to be negative. Um, and so this right here is our explicit sequence. And so B23 is as simple as three times negative two thirds raised to the power of 22 or whatever you get if you feed this to your calculator. Uh, any question there on item number one? Mr. Robinson, I actually have a question. Um, how would you um, write it out if the negative was in the uh, first first term, like if, if it was in N1? So if 13 um, was negative and then 26 over 3 was positive and so on. Uh, oh, that's a good question. So if you had it reversed, that's harder to write. Uh, because you can't just put it on the first term. If you put it on just the first term, then every single um, every single number in the entire sequence would then be negative, right? Because it would be a negative times a positive times a positive times a positive times a positive. So in this case, this is the easy one to deal with where we have negatives on the um, even positions. Even, so if it's yeah. negative on an even position, then you... Uh, just have a negative common ratio but if it's negative positive negative positive then to account for that the easiest way to do it so in case you have um negative uh odd entries uh the easiest way to build that in is to have negative one to the uh n um if you do that, it'll make it so that the odd entries are negative because it'll be negative one to the one will give you a negative number, negative one to the two will give you a positive number, negative one to the three will give you a uh, negative number. All right, thank you. Yeah, because in this sense. case, what we're actually saying here is that this would be exactly equal to 13 times two thirds to the n minus one times negative one to the n minus one. But since these both have the same exponent, we can just multiply in the bases and then that gives us the same equation. Oh, right. But negative one to the n minus one is what will give us negatives on uh, even numbers. Whereas negative one to just the n will give us negatives on odd numbers. Right. Okay, okay, cool, thank you. Uh, and this one here is a little bit trickier. Um, so some geometric sequence has two terms, a3 is equal to 12 and a7 is equal to 972. Uh, what is the explicit sequence, or what do we have to figure out first? Oh, the, the common difference. So there is no common difference because it's geometric. So it's a common what? Multiplier. Yeah, it's a common ratio. So I'm going to think of it this way. How many times was that common ratio applied from A3 to A4, or sorry, from A3 to A7? Four times. Four times. So what this means is that uh, A7 divided by A3 should be equal to R to the fourth, uh, right? If it gets multiplied four times, R times R times R times R has to then be R to the fourth. Uh, with that little bit of initiative, use this information to figure out the explicit sequence. I hear cat wrestling. I'll be right back. Like, we let him take his cone off. Um, and run around because he's finally healthy enough to do that. Uh, but he's still supposed to kind of take it easy. If the cats are being bad, I might have to get put him back in his cage. Give me like a minute or two, I'll be right back. All right, sorry about the delay of game. A cat has been captured and re-imprisoned. Uh, nonetheless, so here in item number two, we were solving for this explicit sequence. Uh, and the motivation for it is the fact that we know that if we're gonna go from A3 to A7, we're gonna have to multiply by uh, our common ratio four times in order to do that. 
And so dividing these two will give us our common ratio to the fourth. So that is to say that we're gonna have 972 divided by 12 is equal to our common ratio raised to the fourth power. So divide and then hit it with the fourth root. So what do we get as our common ratio? Uh-oh, did everybody leave because I left for a second? No, it's some like big number, I think. No, it's not. 81 is equal to three. R to the fourth, so what is R? Three. R Isn't is it 81 three. to the power of four? That's not how math works. Oh, nope. square root, right, okay. Not square root, fourth root. Uh, yeah, yeah, fourth root. Um, okay, so that means our common ratio is three. The other thing that we need to generate the explicit sequence is to figure out what the first term is, which we could do by some method, or here's an easier way to do it. If this is the third term, how can we get backwards to the first term? Divide by three. Divide by three, divide by three. So that is to say, if our third term is 12, divide by three, that means our second term was four, divide by three again, that means our first term, a sub one is equal, to four thirds. And so our explicit sequence must be the following. And it is gonna be equal to four thirds multiplied by three to the n minus one. Uh, are there any questions on today's two parts of this warm up here? Yeah, Mr. Robinson, when you take a, when you take the root like that, would it be plus or minus three or is that forgotten in sequences? In geometric sequences, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and ignore that. Right. Yeah, unless you have some like good specific motivation to know uh, that your common ratio might be negative. But here we can actually uh, guarantee right off the bat that there cannot be a negative involved here because this is, oh, you know what? No, I, I guess technically you could end up, hmm, because both of these are odd numbers, we're either looking at a sequence where every single term is positive or where the... Um, odd numbers are positive and the even numbers I guess might be negative right they could be because I didn't give you information about that um, so to be careful the other thing that you would do is you would add on like maybe times negative one to the n minus one could be an accurate piece to toss on here just because we don't know that that's a good question I guess it's a little ambiguous um, are there any other questions on today's warm-up No? Okay. Uh, nope. So today, like I said, uh, we're going to move along to the 11.4 lecture, just to get it out of the way so that next week we're not learning anything new. Next week on uh, Monday and Tuesday, we'll just be doing workshop and review to get ready for the quiz on Wednesday. So today we'll be talking about 11.4 um, series and their notation. Okay, so the idea of a series here uh, is that a series, uh, it's a very similar idea to a sequence, but when it comes to a sequence, all that we're actually doing is we're listing out a bunch of numbers in sequential order that were generated by the plugging in of some first term. However, when it comes to a series, what we're doing is we're generating all of those exact same terms by some similar rule, um, except we are then going to add them up. So a series is a sum of terms produced by a sequence. Which is why you'll always see these two uh, go hand in hand with each other in mathematics. Uh, you'll never see a chapter called sequence. You'll never see a chapter called series. You always find that the chapter is titled sequence and series because uh, you need one to understand the other. Uh, and so where uh, our series is normally just written as like a, a letter, I'm sorry, our sequence is normally written as a letter. So A would be equal to A1 comma A2 comma A3 comma A4 comma, dot, 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 on forever, or if, uh, you know, you're feeling fancy, these can appropriately go inside of a curly brace, right? Um, this object here is called our sequence. 
our series is typically a capital letter. So in this case, it would be S. Um, and if you wanted, for example, S3 uh, in this case, right, that is asking us to take the sum of all of these terms from one up to three. This is our series. And so, of course, we're not going to do a basic example here. You all know how to add. Um, so let's talk a little bit about our terminology and our notation. Uh, typically, when it comes to this, we have a notion of summation notation. And when it comes to writing down summation notation, uh, this is done by first writing a capital Greek letter, sigma. And while the name of this letter is sigma in mathematics, whenever you see that letter, you want to read it as a sum. And uh, this will always have a lower bound and an upper bound. So this is to say, uh, on the lower bound, we'll have n is equal to a. On the upper bound, we'll typically just have a single letter b. And then out in front of it, you will typically then see some sort of explicit formula uh, for whatever your sequence is that you are going to take and add up. So in terms of uh, bits and pieces here, uh, this bottom value, this is the, <clears throat> oh, and I guess I shouldn't have uh, done it that way. Let me, sorry, let me just change this. From a sub n, she said, I don't want to reuse letters. We'll just make that c sub n. So this bottom value here, this is just the uh, first value. Uh, and then we're going to add all the way up until that top digit, which is our last value. And then this thing here needs to be an explicit sequence. Uh, the recursive sequence equations don't work very well for this. Uh, I mean, they'll give you the same answer, but boy, it's a lot more tedious. So this has to be some sort of explicit uh, sequence. So for example, let's just go ahead and crunch this out by hand uh, for something that's you know fundamental and arithmetic. So for example, let's say that we're doing something where we want the sum from n is equal to 12 all the way up to uh, 16 of negative 2x plus 12. Sorry, negative 2, not x, but n. Uh, so what is this asking us to do? How many numbers are we being asked to generate? How many numbers are we being asked to generate here? And we'll just pretend that this sequence is A. So this is going to be equal to what? This is going to be our 12th term plus our 13th term plus our 14th term plus our 15th term plus our 16th term. Whenever you read something written in summation notation, you are asked to add from this bottom number up to this top number. So here we need to generate out one, two, three, four, five terms and add up all five of those terms. What's our first term? How do we get it? So plug, two. In. Uh, plug in 12 to n. So uh, that first term is gonna be negative two times 12 plus 12, which is negative 12. So this is going to be equal to negative 12. And now to get the rest of these, I could plug them in, I guess, but what kind of arithmetic sequence is this? I'm sorry, what kind of, nah, I gave it away. What kind of sequence is this? Like linear arithmetic. This is arithmetic, which means that we have a common difference. So an easier way to generate the rest of the terms is to just add that common difference. So what does my next term have to be? Hmm. Add the common difference. Negative 14, 14. And then negative 16, and then negative 18, and then negative 20. 
And so the answer to this is just going to be the sum of those digits, negative 12 minus 14 minus 16 minus 18 minus 20. And so the sum of negative 2n plus 12 from n is equal to 12 up until n is equal to 16 is equal to negative 80. Are there any questions on this first one, this fundamental example of like how this notation translates into a thing that we can like process? Um, Mr. Robinson, mm -hmm. how did you get um, uh, A12 through uh, A16, did you just, like, did you just plug in all the values from 12 to 16? Because that's what you're adding. The, the pro that's, that's the request and the problem. Okay. That's what the digits at the bottom and the top of a sigma mean. This means to start here and finish there. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this example? Okay. And so that's boring, that's terrible. That's just asking us to plug and chug. What's actually interesting about series is the fact that for three specific cases that we're going to be talking about today, um, that there is a shortcut, a, a formula for specific sums. Um, and so for this first one, we have a formula uh, for the uh, partial arithmetic uh, sums. And I would be uh, committing some sort of professional negligence if I didn't tell the following story in this exact way. Um, uh, because every math teacher who teaches this topic must tell this exact same anecdote to introduce this idea. It's like, it's, it's the law. So um, this guy, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who's uh, probably, I don't know, there's a lot of fighting about who the best mathematician ever is. There are some people who go to bat for Gauss. It probably wasn't Gauss. It was probably uh, Euler, but uh, nonetheless, Carl Friedrich Gauss, a huge pillar in um, algebra, analytic geometry. He also invented most of the rules that we use when it comes to dealing with electricity and magnetism because he was doing hardcore math at the same time that physicists were developing electricity. Uh, but this dude was smart since he was young. And so like Carl Friedrich Gauss, this homie, right? When he was a boy in elementary school, his uh, math teacher was like, okay, I want everybody to sit down and practice your addition. Add up all the numbers between one and 100, right? Uh, and so he was hoping that that assignment would take them the whole day, but uh, Gauss being the smart lad that he was, was done in a few minutes. And since it was the good old days where you could like, you know, um, hit your students with a ruler, he got uh, punished the old style way uh, just because his teacher assumed he cheated, he was like, oh, you must have asked one of the older kids who did this last year um, what the correct answer was. Uh, but no, it's just that, you know, he was so smart that he was busy inventing brand new math. And so here's how you can add up all the digits from 1 to uh, 100, like, instantly or whatever, right? So Gauss was asked to sum uh, the digits from... 1 to 100. So if you did this like a sucker, you would actually do it. You'd be like 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, plus 5 is 15, plus 6 is 21. And you would spend the whole afternoon adding up all of the digits from 1 to 100, hoping that you made no mistakes. Or you could notice that if you listed them out, 1 and 2 and 3, da 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 all the way up until um, 97, uh, 98, uh, 99, 100, that as you head from the middle and you head backwards, you are subtracting one, subtracting one. But as you head to the right, you are adding one, adding one, adding one, adding one. So if you take into account those movements, the fact that in one direction you're adding one and in the other direction you're subtracting one, in total, those movements are zero, right? That you can force them to cancel out. And here's how he forced those changes to cancel out. Well, if you pair up 1 and 100, the first digit and the last digit, 
the sum of that pair is 101. Uh, now, if you move in one, if you move in one, 99 is one lower than 100, but two is one greater than one. So when you add up two and 99, you still get 101. The same is true if you add up three and 98, you still get 101. So we have pairs here that don't change their amount. So if you take this and you multiply it then by the number of pairs, right? So this right here is the sum of a pair. If we multiply this then by the number of pairs, that would then give us our sum almost instantly. And how many pairs are there if we're adding up digits from one to 100? 50? Yeah, so there's gonna be 50 pairs of digits. And so if you add up all of the digits from one to 100, you get that their sum is 50-50, and you get slapped with a ruler by a, a 1700s teacher because he wanted you to spend the whole afternoon doing this. He didn't want you to be done in a few moments. Um, and so based on this notion, we can derive a general formula that allows us to always write the partial sum of an arithmetic sequence or series uh, very quickly. So if you want um, some sort of partial arithmetic sum to get the sum in one step, all you have to do, S sub n, is take the first term that you are adding up, add that to the last term that you're adding up, uh, which is what we just did up top. It's the first term that we're adding up plus the last term that we're adding up, then multiplied by the number of pairs, which is just the number of numbers over two. Or the other common way that you'll see this is you'll see this with the n up front and the two in the bottom, but know that that form is of course exactly the same. Typically the way that we write this in math textbooks is like this because of tradition. So if you're asked to add up a bunch of digits, it's not because I'm asking you to add up a bunch of digits, it's because there exists some clever form which acts as a shortcut for us. So this is our first uh, shortcut summation equation that you need to be aware of today. Uh, this is the partial arithmetic sum equation. And you should also know that there is no total arithmetic sum equation. This is it in terms of arithmetic sum. Are there any questions on this item here? Item uh, two. Mr. Robinson? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that just cancel in? Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, I'll just put this in the Excuse me? So isn't it still equal to like room? Oh, I'm sorry. This nine. is a two. That's what I get for reading and writing two different things at the same time. That's a two. Uh, are there any questions on this item? No? Okay. Uh, I think that one's fairly intuitive. That one is pretty easy to see. But where this section gets a lot more interesting, and this is the stuff that I wanted to get out of the way before the weekend came, is how we can do this for a geometric series, right? Uh, and that is a lot harder of a thing to see. The derivation for uh, partial uh, geometric sums is a lot wilder. It's a much more satisfying relationship. So um, geometric series. And for this first talk on geometric series, this first one is going to be partial. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and say that we were being asked to add up some sort of geometric series. And if we were to do that, right, if we were to just start off by listing out all of the terms in our geometric series, um, that would tell us that the total sum of our geometric series is gonna be equal to all of our terms if we add them up. So our first term is just a sub one. And then to get the next term here, what would we do if this is in fact geometric? Multiply by the common ratio. We're gonna multiply by the common ratio. So this next term here is gonna be plus r a1 plus r squared a1 plus r cubed a1, da 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 da, da all the way down until we would arrive at our final term, uh, which would be um, r 
to the n minus one a one, right? Because we terminate at at uh, n minus one, just based on the way that the equation works for the geometric series. Uh, is that okay? So that's just what a geometric series would be asking us to do if we were actually going to do it by hand, right? However, luckily, very clever mathematicians came before us, and so they figured out the following manipulation. How somebody saw this, I have no idea, because this first step is not obvious, but everything that flows after this first step is obvious. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take both sides of this equation, and I'm going to multiply them by R. So on the left-hand side, this is gonna give us R multiplied by the sum of this. And notice, if we were to do that on the right-hand side, if we were to multiply this entire thing by R, the first term becomes A1 to the R, and then it's gonna step up every single one of these powers by one. So if I multiply this by R, it becomes R squared. Multiply this by R, becomes R cubed. Multiply this by R, becomes R to the fourth, all the way down. So multiplying R in to the sum is gonna give us uh, R A1, plus r squared a1 plus r cubed a1 plus r to the fourth a1 duh, 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 all the way down and here it's going to change that because here if i were to multiply by one more common ratio it would increase my exponent by one what's n minus one plus one just n just n, just n. so this would become r to the n times a1 right and now what i'm going to do in order to invent some brand new mathematics uh remember last section when we were dealing with matrices we said it's always a legal operation to take one equation and add it to another i'm going to do that same thing i'm going to take these two equations and i'm going to add them together except i'm going to subtract this bottom equation from the top equation even though there's an infinite number of terms here, I can still subtract these entire equations. So on the left-hand side, this gives us something pretty natural. This is to say it's the sum of the sequence minus r times the sum of the, um, I'm sorry, the sum of the series multiplied by r times the sum of the series. And on the right-hand side, uh, this is going to do something pretty cool. What's r a1 minus r a1? Zero. zero. What's r squared a1 minus r squared a1? Zero. Notice it's going to make basically every single one of the terms in the series cancel out. So uh, these two are equal and opposite, equal and opposite, uh, equal and opposite. Even though it's not written, this guy will have a term that he is equal and opposite with. So as we go through and we subtract out all of these values, uh, cancels, 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 cancels with something I didn't bother writing down. Same thing even up here. This guy is gonna get canceled out because there is an R to the N minus one that I haven't written down. And in the end, only two terms are gonna survive here. What are the only two surviving terms once we subtract these equations? A1 and R to the N A1. Yup, those are the only two things on the right-hand side which survive. So this is gonna be A1, um, minus, the minus is important because we're subtracting this whole bottom equation, minus r to the n a1. This is one of the best derivations in pre-cal, very elegant. Now the point of this is to try and produce an equation which gives us the sum of the geometric series. So I'm going to take this right here and I'm going to solve this for s sub n, which means I just factor it out. On the left hand side that's s sub n is going to be, or multiplied by 1 minus r is going to be equal. And then here I can also factor out the a1. So this is going to be a1 times 1 minus r to the n. And now to get s sub n alone, all I have to do is divide both sides by uh, 1 minus r. And so our partial geometric series sum is going to be equal to a1 times 1 minus r to the n, then divided by 1 minus r. This equation, based on these very fancy manipulations, will very quickly let you add up the desired number of terms within a geometric series. So, for example, here's why we like this. Yes? Explain that one more time. I didn't fully get it. 
like where's the one minus r coming from? So you just have to look at the algebra. The one minus r comes from the fact that I'm subtracting these equations. This is Sn minus Rsn, factor out Sn. All right, I got it. And then here on the right, same thing. I subtract and everything cancels. This is should be the only hard part to understand. But if you have a hard time seeing this, take it and write out like more terms. And you'll see that no matter how many terms you write out by these manipulations, every middle term cancels out. And the only survivors are the first term here and the final term here. Factor out A1 and then divide just so that it's clean. So this is to say that if I were to be asked for the following explicit sum, let's say that we were asked to add up all of the digits from n is equal to 1 all the way up to n is equal to uh, 100 of the following sequence. Um, 6 raised, uh, sorry, 6 times 3 uh, to the n minus 1. If we were actually asked to do this, that means that we are being asked to add up all of the digits, uh, starting with 6, and then what would our next digit be? Uh, eight, 18. And then? Fifty-four. All right. Each time we're multiplying by that common ratio of three, all the way down until we uh, arrived at our final term, which would be uh, six times three to the ninety-nine. Right. So you would have to add up all one hundred of these digits, and it would be very time-consuming. Instead of that, since we are aware that this is an equation that exists for this exact case, we can use this to get our sum in a single step. Our sum for this should be equal to our first term, 6, multiplied by 1 minus 3 to the n, where n is uh, the final term that we're adding up to. So 1 minus 3 to the 100, then divided by 1 minus 3. And this will add up the entire sequence for us all in one step. Same as before, how instead of adding up all the digits from 1 to 100, right, by like being a sucker or whatever, um, like you could do that and get the correct answer, or you could use an equation which does the same thing by trickery. This equation does the same thing as this, more or less by trickery. Um, is this okay? Yeah. It's a very, very fancy uh, equation. Um, and if you like plug it in, you know, you get a really crazy big number because adding up geometric terms produces very, very large numbers. Like already by the third number, we're in the 50s. This was going to give us 1.5 times 10 to the 48, which is some hugely large number chased by 48 zeros. So again, instead of doing all of this and adding up 100 giant numbers by hand, a single operation gives it to us. The sum is equal to uh, 1.54 dot 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 times 10 to the 48. Very, very big number. Very big. Something with 48 zeros. Um, and so the final little bit of my talk for today is about our final equation, where this is a partial geometric series. The other thing that we can do here is that in a specific case, we can actually generate um, the total sum. So again, what I'm about to say here is for a geometric series. But a total geometric series. Which is to say that uh, we are being asked to take all of the digits in a geometric series, not just the first one and the last one, but all of them, every single one of them, which is to say uh, we're being asked to add up some sort of geometric series uh, a sub 1 times r to the n minus 1 from n is equal to uh, 1 all the way up literally to infinity. Now, normally you can't do this, but for one very specific case of geometric series, you can. So as long as uh, if uh, r is convergent, which is to say r is a fractional number that specifically falls between 1 and 0, right? 
um, the infinite sum, which is what this is, the infinite sum is actually calculable. You can literally take all of the digits from zero to infinity and add every single one of them up. And instead of getting infinity or some sort of equation, the answer to that infinite sum is just a number. And uh, here is where the motivation for it comes from. Uh, it's the same thing as this guy. It's still just the sum of these digits being equal to the first digit times one minus r to the n divided by one minus r. But what we need to do in order to get the infinite sum equation is to modify this, minus r to the n. So what I just said is that uh, r to the n here, right? Um, R is some sort of convergent value, and N is going upwards to infinity. So if I were to look at these common ratios as we like go up along numbers, so let's just say for the sake of argument here on the side, R is equal to one half, right? What's R squared? A quarter. Fourth. Okay, uh, what's R cubed? One eighth. What's R to the 100? What would this be for our 100th term? One over two to the power of 100. Which is already getting really small. And so here's the argument. And what I'm about to say is not technically correct, but this is kind of what leads us into calculus. What do you think R to the infinity is if, uh, these just, keep, these just keep getting smaller, right? Smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is already to a point where this is so small, I would consider ignoring it. If you allow yourself to take this ever decreasing R and let it go to infinity, we say that this goes basically to zero and we'll treat it that way. So as long as you have the special case of R, we're gonna say that R to the infinity is zero. And so for an infinite geometric series, S sub n can be calculated just by using the first digit, a sub one, and dividing it by one minus r. This only works for a convergent series, uh, but so long as you have a convergent series, right, which is to say every step your geometric series is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, you can actually add up all of the digits from zero to infinity just by taking the first term and dividing it by one minus r. Uh, we'll stop here for today. When we come in on Monday, we'll do an example of this, and we'll also look at a graph uh, of this scenario to see how this is possible. How is it that you can add up an infinite number of numbers, but your answer is still something finite? Uh, I'll also be posting the 11.4 homework today, so if you want to get started on that, you can, but it won't be due until like next week, the night before the quiz. You all have a nice week. Uh, wrap up the 11.3 homework and turn it in. It's due Monday night, and I'll see you guys on Monday. Um, this is Robinson. Robinson. Yes. I had a quick question. Um, like two days ago, you had mentioned that we were going to vote, like when it came to the date for the 11, um, like chapter 11, mid chapter quiz. Oh, yeah, I did totally say that, but I forgot about it. Yeah. So what, what was, yeah, I totally forgot. Sorry. I had a, yeah. I had stuff to deal with yesterday. So what did I say? You told us we could vote to take it either before our AP exam or like after all of our AP exams. Would you actually vote to move it after? I really don't mind. So. Um, yeah, okay, I mean, sure. I, I would. I'll, I, would. Uh, right. I think that's a bad idea, but I'll post a vote and uh, we'll stick to it. Look for that going up in a few minutes. And of course, after all the votes come in, a uh, subsequent um, posting of the results. Uh, you all have a nice day and I'll see you on Monday. Right. Thank See you, Mr. Robinson. See you, Mr. Robinson.